organizing in the landscapes of the West. He graduated from Sam Houston. He assisted Ansel Adams while attending Sam Houston. He recently was a 2014 artist in residence at Hubble Trading Post in Granado, Arizona. He's very well known for his captivating landscapes, but currently is working on a series that he calls Kinetic Still Life. And he has an upcoming solo exhibition at the Tyler Museum of Art this year. Uh, please give Robert Langham a round of applause. Like the 60s, they're going to get turned on first. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't drop out. <laughs> Just quiet. Yeah. <laughs> so what are we to make of this pixie stick process that we find ourselves in? It's hard to know which one to pick up first. And this kind of mania for the new and latest thing, the mania for the new and the, as, as the Buddhists would say, modern life experience of uh, every day is like being attacked by 10,000 demons. You have this to do, you have that to do, the yard's got to be mowed, the laundry's got to be done, you've got to make yourself a yeah. So as an artist, um, immediately, and as an artist over 50, with all apologies and respect to everybody that's here under that age, I would never trust an artist under 50. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so immediately I think I'm going to go back to basics. So in, in back to basics, really is just what are, what are human beings do, what human consciousness or how do you control yourself? And one of the first questions that I asked myself was, where am I? Now, I was born and raised in Tyler, and the, the show I'm doing at the Tyler Art Museum is going to be 100 Tylerites, and the definition of a Tylerite is uh, you have to be able to walk to the place of your birth in Tyler, Texas, in 20 minutes or less. <laughs> you can walk where you're born in 20 minutes or less, you're in the show. Uh, if, if not, well, then we need to talk. <laughs> but I wanted to locate myself. So, um, and I'm, you know, I saw myself as a landscape photographer. I had a, you know, loved landscapes. Had this kind of connection. I felt like to the. But of course, I went out west. I went to an Ansel Adams workshop, and then you come back to East Texas, and your mind is full of granite walls and blue skies and the West, the space and the light of the West, and you're in East Texas, which is not like that at all. So you have to, you know, you, as a young artist, that was a big stunt. It took me a while to figure out what was going on. But finally, reading about East Texas culture and the ancient, like I say, always going back as far as I could go back. The first people in the area lived the same place as we live, and they organized themselves around the watershed. Everybody that's related lived either upstream or downstream from. And as soon as your campsite ran out of firewood, where people got tired of farming the little field, you had to move a mile up or a mile down and burn up the firewood for a while. So every little hilltop up and down these creeks is full of village sites from the Catalans and the free Catalans. And uh, Tyler's of course, known as a, as a big trade center. And they said, well, Indian trails crossed about where the square is. Well, what it turns out on a USGS map, the Sabine River comes watersheds coming from one direction, and the Angelina watersheds coming from another direction. And so when people walked upstream from the, from the Angelina and ran out of Angelina, they crossed over into the Sabine River or the, a different watershed that was full of different people. Sister, I'm, I'm making enough sense. I'll, I'm going to try to keep this pretty simple. So I, I immediately got out a map out where I was in the watershed. So right now, I have to be able to tell you, we're not standing in my watershed. I'm out of my country slightly. We live on Black Fork Creek, which goes around and joins with Kickapoo Creek and becomes the Natchez River watershed. And on the Natchez River, you could walk up in pre-Columbian Caddo and times, you could walk upstream or downstream, and it's all your first cousins and your second cousins and your third cousins. And 
but when you cross to another watershed, they may speak the same language and be very similar, but they're, it's a different group of folks. So if you want to trade, you walk upstream until you cross over. You know, stuff from the Gulf flows up, stuff from the plains comes down. So I found myself, Black Fork Creek. That's where I live. That's where I want, I want to make art in Black Fork Creek. In fact, my email is blackfork6 AOL.com. That tells you how old I am. Uh, I've got an AOL email. So I'm at the sixth fork of the Black Fork Creek above its confluence with Kickapoo to make the Nature's River. So that's actually where our house in town now. Of course, Black Fork Creek is buried under a WPA water, you know, storm water system, those old red rock. Nobody knows where. And, and that's one of the problems with modern life. This pixie stick, 10,000 demon, demon attacking kind of life that we live, where we have this mania for the newest, latest thing. People don't know where they are. So it helped me a lot just to locate myself, photographing landscapes. Okay, I want, I want to set that idea to the side for a second. And the other idea is, I, I wanted to use the basic human tools to kind of access my world. So the first human technological act, making fire. Now, I was just the other night on TV, which is a great thing, watching Naked and Afraid. <laughs> they take a man and a woman who had men, strip them butt naked, and dump them off in some god-awful wilderness that nobody lives in, which I have a hint, nobody lives in a wilderness in the 21st century. It's not that livable. You know, people live in the moderate, the places where people live and so they dump on the first thing these people are frantically trying to make fire. If they get a fire, they can boil water, they can drink cleaner, or they sterilize water, they can cook food, they can keep animals, stay warm. They, the basic human technological fire. So it, just if you can make fire, raise your hand. If just sticks and stuff you'll find out in the it's rare. Now eventually you might teach yourself to make fire because you've seen it on the naked and afraid. Okay. Make it fire. But almost every art student that you curators are ever going to have to deal with, art historians to deal with, they've been to ceramics class, they've been to, they've been making fire, they've been dealing with fire, they've been watching fire change things. They've got a little more appreciation of fire. But I think it makes people a little uneasy not to be able to make fire. Okay, here's a post-it off my notes. Can anybody make a post-it? How about a, uh, what else? Something simple. How about a coin? Anybody make a coin? Or a big pen? Can you make any item you see in this room, including central air conditioning? <laughs> And, and so people, I think, are a little unsettled at some internal level that they can't make things. Now, the first slide we saw today was the, the kid sitting at the computer and he's thinking, am I as good as the old masters? And then the kid at the easel, am I as good as the old master? And then the guy from the Renaissance, the student in the atelier doing a Michelangelo, am I as good as the old master? And then you get back to the guy who has nothing, he lives in a and he says, I'm the greatest. <laughs> because he can, everything that can be done in a really pre technological society, everybody knew. Can you imagine living at a time when you knew everything there was to know? I can make a clay pot, I can an animal, I can skin an animal, I know who God is, I know, you know, what the weather's going to be like next year, I've seen people give birth. I've, but now, even though we know a lot more, we really don't know anything kind of at a level that... So as an artist, I'm bouncing this. Where am I? You know, and, and what, can I, what can I do? Okay. The other technological advance that humans made that kind of separated their consciousness and got us on this is being able to talk. Now, I've already just rubbed all over y'all with language and 
ideas expressed in language. And of course, we've heard these brilliant ideas by these young scholars about using language. So I suggest, in fact, I've always thought this would be, a, I could retire as an artist and start giving seminars, go into big corporate headquarters at 2,500 bucks a head and teach everybody to make fire. And Google or Apple, go in and teach the seminar where at the end of the seminar, you go home and you go, honey, I made fire and I'm sticking. It'd be expensive, but it'd be fun. And I think it would settle people down if you could do the basic things, but we can't all talk. So what do we talk about? We talk about ideas. So humans that can plot and plan. Now, I mean, I've got the big beehive that lives in a tree over on the Blackfoot Creek at Black Fork 6, and the bees communicate. But they don't really evolve very quickly like humans have, because they don't talk about the ideas of the hive, even though they do certainly communicate. But human beings talk and talk and talk. So how do you have a good idea? I'm an artist. I want some fresh, new. I've got this mania for the new. I want a new, fresh idea for my art. So I've learned how to do this. How to have an idea. How, how many ideas do you think there are floating in the ether, waiting on humans to figure them out? There's an unlimited supply. So I've learned my technique is I start with a stupid idea. I, my, my poor students, I, I say, well, I want you to shoot a still life. Get something out of the trash. And they're a little taken a skin. Just, just start with a stupid idea. And of course, the idea is all of you that have done any kind of project, especially an art project, know. The idea is the important thing. The starting is the important thing. If you just get started, if you're going to, if you say, I'm not going to start until I've got a genius idea, the genius ideas never come. But the stupid ideas are two dozen for a dime. You can always come start with a stupid idea and get started, and it'll get a little better and a little better and a little better and a little better. Before you know it, you'll be highly competent, if not genius. Start, start in one of, the, one of your research pieces we heard t tonight. I mean, I know you're challenged with that all the time. Just start with a stupid idea. I'm going to write about the art on the bottom of my shoe. Well, that's stupid. But you'll think, no. I'm going to write about the idea of shoes. No, I'm going to write about the idea of, you, you'll, you'll take off. I mean, let me explain a human idea in a pretty easy way. So here's my keychain. Here's a brass key. Now, is this, or is anything in this room, including the central air conditioning, it, it looks like brass, doesn't it? I mean, it is brass. It's made out of brass. But this is not really a key. This is a human idea called forth in some kind of physicality. Some human had to have the idea, I need a key, and lock. Okay, somebody thought this key up. The committee sat down, or one genius sat down, and you know, first they just had a key that just had a thing on it, and then they first they just had two a string to tie the door shut. Then you come up with, well, I'm gonna like a piece of wood that latches, it, and then I'm gonna like put a rock by the door. You know, you keep keep coming with a better idea. You start with a stupid idea, and they get better and better and better. Obviously, I didn't invent something to lock. Okay, that idea comes before the idea of a key. I've got to have something valuable enough that, that I want to put it somewhere that nobody else can get it. So that idea, you have to have something you want before you start building a sh shelter or a place to put it, to put a door on it, to put a lock on it, to get a key to open the lock. You can see how these ideas kind of stack up. So none of our ideas, and we've come so far now, none of us can do anything. I mean, I could make a number two pencil my life depended on it. And I can stall them with my words long enough that maybe I can figure something, some way to get away. So here I am, I'm in Blackboard <laughs> Studio. Okay. 
Everybody just sit tight for about three minutes. I'm going to tell you about an experience. So this, this is ideas coming to you in language. And then I'm going to go visually and actually show you some photographs. So I go to this party. And I knew it was going to be a good party. But I didn't know it was going to be a fabulous party. It's in a great, I get there, it's in a great house. It looked up like a Chinese lantern. It's a pretty expensive house. And it's in a great lawn. You know, it's, just, it's impressive. Even the doors, the entryway is impressive. And I go in and the place is packed. Expensive cars outside, glorious, gorgeous, handsome, older, you know, and younger people. Kids running around, great food. You can smell the food, you can smell the perfume, you can smell the axe, you know, that the <laughs> gay cousin is wearing. You know, it's just a, it's just a lush, unbelievable. So I'm walking around this party, and this is the actual party I went to. So I'm walking around this party, and, and people, you know, I'm introducing this eight people I know, these people I know, these people I know, they know me, I don't know them, I know them, they don't know me. Meeting new people, what do you do? You know. But all of a sudden I start getting this this sense that I'm meeting, you know, John Smith. But John Smith's not his real name. And I'm meeting, you know, Mary James. But Mary James is not quiet. When you say Mary James, and all of a sudden I have this insight into everybody I meet, that I know their secret name. Each person has a real name. And as soon as I meet John Smith, I think, good to meet him. And I don't mention it to him, but I know their real, and their real name, when you say it, completely defines them in absolute truth. Like, they'll, they'll come to me, well, this is so-and-so, so-and-so, and I go, not quiet, but close and I'm glad to see them. But I see them in, just in complete clarity. Their dramas, their corruption, their you know, excellence, their all the combination of things. That, so, of course, then the party's like being drunk at this party. You're going around meeting this person, it's like meeting a kid, and you're going, oh my God, this kid. You know, they're like a crystal. You just see all of them. You meet this older person, it's like, they're so precious and old and knowledgeable. And, and it's kind of a faux pas to mention their secret name to them. I mean, some of them know their secret name just because they know themselves so well. They know they're, you know, not the label that's been hung on them. They're some... So, I mean, it's just... Can you imagine? I mean, it's just an intoxicating experience. And of course, what I'm not, what I'm describing is not a, not a real party that I went to. It's a dream that I had. It's common to artists. And of course, you curator people and people, people who love art and have a passion for art, like all of us do, um, you recognize this: the secret knowledge of artists, knowing the true nature of things, uh, being able to see new surfaces, being able to see layered surfaces, being able to experience things on. I mean, that's what this dream I'm thinking is about. And if you're an artist, and probably even if you're not, you'll have had this dream or you'll have this dream sometime in your career. There's other dreams. You know, I had a dream where I knew how to take a perfect, God, this was so, it was just, I hated to wake up. You know, I kind of hoped I'd die in my sleep, so I knew how to take a perfect photograph every time. And I, I can't tell you, it was just like this far away from where I was. It was just like, just a little shift in something that I did, and all of a sudden I'm like, God. It. And then I woke up and I lost it. But just having the sensation of having it one time that you're Michelangelo, you know, and every, you know, or a great Zen master, that every little brushstroke is like full of truth and the essence and the meaning of meaning. Well, meanwhile, we're all lost in this technological. So, I wasn't in the West, I was in the East, I'm in Smith County, I'm in Blackboard Creek, 
blackboard drainage. So I want to take some photographs in blackboard drainage. So I'm shooting landscape photographs, which I thought were moderately true and successful, but I kept bumping into fellow black forkians, you know, turtles, snakes, birds, deer, foxes, armadillos, possums, whatever there was around, that I realized also lived in my same watershed. And of course, these possums have been here longer than the Caucasians, that, you know, the long-nosed, arrogant sons of bitches that came striding out of Europe a couple of millennia ago to cover up the world. And uh, so I wanted to take pictures of some animals. Some of my fellow beings. But I wasn't Elliot Porter and I wasn't going to photograph them in the zoo. And I, I thought, how am I going to photograph these things? So very carefully, I started this project. And as soon as I started the project, like any artistic project, animals just come raining out of the sky. You know, the neighbors got a pet bird. The, 90 year old lady next door calls and says, I think there's something wrong with my garbage. So I go over and there's a possum in her garbage. You know, there's owls in the attic, there's wasps in the. So let me show you just a couple of these. Now, I don't know how this works. It's witchcraft. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Beth promised me if I push this button, something will appear behind my head. So this is snails from under the pot, flower pot. Black fork snails. Yeah. Some kind of major land snails. And like any artist, I'm constantly, you know, shoving and pushing and I'm, it's a pain in the ass, people, from my English. <laughs> this is the poor woman from the black from the uh, donut shop. Okay, just a high school kid. I was always pleasant and I, I love counter people because they you just give them money and they give you whatever, they give you coffee, they give you donuts. So I'm always excessively polite and respectful. It's the only time I've ever hired a model for a photograph for 20 bucks. And I said, I just want to photograph your hand. She didn't know about the snails. <laughs> she held still, es Eslin was her name. She was a good Tylerite. But she got covered up with, you, you have to hold a snail up against somebody's skin before it kind of takes traction before they relax enough to get a hold, and then they start cruising. And snails have a little bit of a bad rap. They're faster than you think. They start cruising around in this poor woman's hand. So this is kind of a typical, this was called the Black Fork, of course, Beast Theory, Black Fork Creek. A Beast Theory, you historians, you know what a Beast Theory is. It was a, it's an ancient book form, one of the really early books that wasn't a religious text. It's got a description of animals, usually one illustration, and then a written, you know, have a drawing of bees, and then it have a, a written piece that told you everything you need to know about bees. They're, you know, the bees live in a big hive, they're ruled by their queen, they're very industrious, all the good things about bees. But besides bees and horses and wolves and chickens and fish, they also had the phoenix. Nobody had seen one, but they had a picture of the phoenix, they had the griffin, they had centaur, they had a uh, sea serpent. I mean, th their, their catalog had a little more imagination left in the end for animals they hadn't even seen. So I wanted the Black Fork Bestiary to be a selection of photographs that had pictures of the, and then a little story. So there's writing to go with each of these. It's a book project. Um, here's a typical Black Fork story. A black widow. So, um, in the Bible, in Job, you know, the Bible, which is a piece of literature that's important to all of us historically and religiously and otherwise, but in Job, so I don't know if you know the story of Job. I hate to have to repeat everything, but Job is favored by God. He has a million horses, he has a million goats, he has a million sons, he has a million. He's blessed. And um, in, in Job, the time comes when the Lord summons all the angels, all the hosts of heaven to you know, be with him, and they all come in, and Satan's among them. And he asks Satan, where have you been? Because Satan's a little bit of a troublemaker, even before he fell from heaven. 
And Satan replies, it's one of the great, my favorite quote in the Bible, perhaps. Satan replies, ranging over the earth and foot walking up and down upon it. Satan's been doing what I like. You know, I like to range over Blackport, walk up and down on it by foot. He says, have you considered my servant Job? And they go to talk about Job. Satan says, just test it. Take some of that stuff you've blessed him with away and he'll curse you to your face. So they go through this whole thing. Finally, Job is reduced to sitting on his trash pile, spraying himself with a piece of broken pot because he's covered with boils. And God shows up to talk to him. And God's in a whirlwind. So I'm foot walking around the Black Fork and I break out and hunt deer. I walk through this fence line and here comes this dust devil. And I think, I'm an artist. I'm going to go talk to God. That's how long my nose is and how arrogant I am coming from Europe. So I shuck off my rifle and sack and stuff and run over and get in the world. I don't know if you've ever gotten in a world. Has anybody done that? It's kind of a weird. I always think I'm kind of an, an outlier. But I get in this whirlwind because I think, they told me about this since I was a kid in Sunday school. You know, I'm going to be with God in this. So I'm in this way, of course, the whirlwind. They're full of grit and dirt. They're terrible. I mean, you get, you know, I'm getting, I can tell I'm like getting dirt all over me and stuff bumping into me. But I can just, through my gritted eyes, I can just kind of see the footprint bending the grass and I'm like running with it. Finally, it gets away from me and jumps the fence. And I think, well, I'm not quite as direct as Job. But, you know, Job gets this really epic speech from God about creation. Everybody's place in the universe. I'm kind of standing there thinking, but at least I did it. And I look down in my shirt, I'm covered with hundreds of grasshoppers. Mm-hmm. And of course, I just had to kind of wait for the grasshoppers to or when it's turned out they're full of grasshoppers. So that's a typical little story that goes with one of these books. There's some barred frogs. There's a little copperhead in a martini glass. It's awesome. So this series has a lot of human hands, has a lot of containers, has a mix of eye contact. My daughter's hand with our favorite bug. She's always trying to wear a cicada to school as a brooch. (laughs) (laughs) The crow that blew out of the... um, I've got to photograph my fellow black forkians. So the the bestiary is... uh, it's in Albany, Texas right now. It's been exhibited over the years several places. It was a, um, a note card by Borealis Press in uh, Blue Hill, Maine. They sell note cards at Barnes and Nobles and Hastings. And so the crow on the back of the hand was one of those images in the, like almost every one of those. There's one image of a big snapping turtle on a fence post. Now, in the history of history, there's never been a turtle on a post. But immediately after that note card went nationwide, these stupid jokes about, usually they're political. You know, President Clinton, he's like a turtle on a post. He didn't know how he got there. He didn't know what he's doing. Or Bush, he's like a turtle on a post. And then Obama, he's like a turtle on a post. Just a few nights ago, Hillary Clinton said, you know, Bernie, he's like a turtle on a post. She actually said that, and, and I guarantee you that comes from the note card of me walking down and putting a, a, a female snapping turtle that just wanted to lay eggs up on a fence post and photograph her. I wish I had brought that slide. But so some of these kind of have made it into the popular culture. Now this is a new series. I 
wanted a photograph of still lifes. And I wanted a photograph from right out of the yard. And I wanted a photograph of common materials. Now listen, you guys are artists and historians and art historians. Everybody knows what a still life is, or raising a still life. Still lifes are how you learn to paint and draw. Okay? You go to class, there's 20 out there, they put a bone and a shell and a bottle, it's a piece of wood, and everybody stands at their easel. Everybody's been through that experience, and that's how you start. Now that's how they've taught art ever since the Egyptians. You know, put two pairs on the edge of a table and everybody started. Of course, the Egyptians had a big eye on the side of the pair. <laughs> That, that's how you teach people, <laughs> teach their hand and their, and their brain and their eye to work together to paint these still lifes. So painters that come out of the ateliers in Europe and, other, and before that keep painting still lifes because they think it's a legitimate subject matter. And it is. I mean, Van Gogh's sunflowers and all the great still lifes by the Impressionists and before and since. But they're not photographic. If I take a picture, put two pairs on the corner of the table, and then take a picture of it, the picture is kind of the, the photograph is kind of the second generation. It's an image of a piece of sculpture that I've made. This is a new idea. Let this soak in for a second, especially if you're in art history. Still lifes have no photographic tradition. If I take a picture of it, I'm really, a, I'm, I'm like converting it. I, even Weston with his gorgeous shells and stuff, he's making a sculpture. And then he's taking a picture of it and showing the picture. And it's like, I kind of like to see that sculpture if that's okay. You know, let me see the original. So I wanted to make photographs that had to have a camera to record them. So then I start thinking with a stupid idea, start with a stupid idea. I think, okay, things are going to melt, or they're going to burn, or they're going to balance, or they're going to be poured, you know, past the camera, or they're going to be flying, or they're going to be because a camera with its time function, it can photograph things longer than you can see, and it can photograph things shorter than you can see. It, these these images will require a camera. You can't see them without a camera. I'm going to drag still life firmly over into the photographic ground. Did I explain this? I, I mean, I'm dealing with some fairly high octane art history people right here. This is a new idea, I guarantee. You know, there's been Harold Edgerton's instantaneous photographs like a bullet leaving a gun or a foot kicking a football. He's close to what I'm thinking. I'm just a little more intensive. And I'm working just out of the backyard. My studio is actually under the watercolorist AC Gentry. My little studio is over there. So I 